hoped you are giving up an hour of your time today to join us. Um, our webinar today is on funding your nonprofit. Uh, it is not about grants. Um, as you probably know, if you have been in business for a while, grants are very difficult. Uh, and we do have another webinar coming up on uh, basics of, of grants. But this is for the alternative types of funding that are available to you as a nonprofit. Um, but first, I want to give you a little information about SCORE. Uh, so SCORE is the largest network of free volunteer small business mentors in the nation. So no matter what stage your business is, we can find a mentor that will help you. Uh, aside from the 100 uh, approximately mentors that we have in Cleveland, there are 10,000 across the country that we can tap into if you have a special need that we are unable to fulfill. So no matter what uh, your business is, you can go to our website, sign up for a mentor, and whoever you start mentoring with can call on anyone across the country to co-mentor. Our mission is to foster vibrant small business communities. We do this through mentoring and education. Our purpose is to give all of you as small business owners the support that you need to be successful. Uh, we know that small businesses drive the economy and particularly true in Cleveland. So we're grateful to you as a small business owner uh, to contribute to our community. Here are some numbers uh, on the national level, what we have done in the past year with over 31,000 new businesses started, 120,000 jobs, uh, total number of jobs created. So we are really pleased with the way things are going and uh, we hope that we can help you with your business. Uh, we have many different types of business owners, uh, approximately 10% of our business owners are uh, veterans. More than half are women, which we're very pleased with, um, at least I'm very pleased with. So welcome to all. Um, we Each mentor signs a cone of, of ethics on an annual basis to protect your information. We do not uh, ever share your information with, with others. We don't make money from what we learn from you and we protect all of your information. It's all confidential. So this is a snapshot of our website. You can sign up for a mentor here. Uh, you can view not only what live workshops are coming up, but also there are approximately 85 or 90 recorded webinars. So if you saw something that you wanted to join and you were unable to, you can go to our website and you can probably find it there. There are also a lot of other resources, articles, blogs, etc that will help you get started in your small business. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. Our services are free. Um, we don't charge. We're supported both by the Small Business Administration and many different organizations in Cleveland who specifically want to see small businesses in Cleveland be successful. I will point out uh, before we get started, that you will receive a copy of the slides and also a link to the recording. Um, here is a QR code that takes you directly to our website or a link. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let uh, 
Bob Fedor, who is our presenter today. Um, again, yes, you will receive a copy of the webinar. Um, and Bob, you can bring up your slides and get started. I, are they, can you see them now? Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Anita. Uh, again, my name's Bob Fedor. I've been with SCORE uh, about 17 years now, and I was responsible for funding SCORE on a local basis, both here in Cleveland for about five years and in the Philadelphia area for a number of years. Uh, I've also had a large number of nonprofit uh, clients who are looking for funding. And uh, it's so I've had a reasonable amount of experience. I'm going to point out, though, that uh, there is no simple uh, uh, formula. It really depends on your nonprofit and who might be able to fund it. And we'll go into that in detail. But there's no simple template. That's the word I was using. OK. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, the statistics on nonprofit funding. Where do you look for funding opportunities? Uh, how to identify opportunities that are the most relevant for your business and things to consider about individual donations. Uh, probably the most important thing to, to uh, realize is your need for fundraising. Uh, up to 50% of time and effort should go to this effort, uh, at least by one person. And if you do not have the ability to charge service fees, it's it's much more important to do that. Uh, of course, the greatest need for nonprofits is money. Uh, and uh, that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this presentation, how to get that money. Now, typical sources of uh, the uh, funds is about half in general come from service fees and sales of goods. Uh, about 25% come from government contracts for services and charitable giving uh, typically accounts for less than 25%. Now that varies tremendously. Now, as I mentioned, SCORE is a nonprofit. Uh, we do not get service fees and sales of goods. We choose to give all our services free, such as this webinar. We get some money from the SBA that would follow, I guess, under government contracts. And the rest of our funding, 75 or about 85% of our funding, comes from charitable giving from either uh, foundations or corporations. Typical examples of uh, fee for service is obviously uh, hospitals bill patients, and uh, you know hospitals are nonprofits, or at least most are. Museums charge admission fees. Uh, some theaters sell tickets. Uh, civic organizations charge dues. Colleges, which are nonprofits mostly, uh, they require tuition. Uh, that's where uh, the business model requires. Uh, fee for services. An example, Girl Scouts, as we all know, and uh, I guess this earlier this spring that was the campaign, uh, Girl Scout cookies sales, about 27% of the proceeds goes to the cost of the goods. The balance, over 80%, goes into uh, programs or member supports, et cetera. But uh, so they get about 80% uh, to promote their uh, programs. Now, other examples is WBIZ, our local uh, uh, NPR station, has an annual auction. Uh, many nonprofits have balls or dinners where admissions include sizable donations. Uh, you'll see uh, golf tournaments on behalf of nonprofits, uh, 5K, 10Ks, buddy walks. Uh, the thing we're trying to point out here, though, is all these require a lot of effort uh, and uh, events. Uh, you have to decide, is it worth the effort uh, uh, 
In other words, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. Uh, we at SCORE, for example, uh, uh, do not do golf tournaments because the uh, effort is so large uh, to organize it and there's such a minimum audience for it. Uh, now, you may be uh, surprised, this is 2022, uh, during uh, COVID, uh, almost a half a trillion dollars in the United States was uh, given. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, when I, I guess our GDP uh, gross domestic product is like 34 trillion. So well, that's, that's a considerable amount of it. It's one, uh, let's see, a half a trillion, I think 35. It's about uh, 5%, something like that. Individuals give 64% uh, of it. Foundations, 21% and corporations 15%. You may be surprised by this, and it says that fundamentally for most nonprofits, you go after individuals. And, but it's also important to diversify. You certainly do not want to have uh, all your funding coming from uh, one entity or one type of entity. You want to spread it as much as possible. Now, where do the uh, funds, charitable dollars go? Uh, religion, education, human ser services, grant-making foundations, and public society benefits. Uh, it, it, despite the uh, COVID, uh, donations increased in every sec sector uh, and uh, increased very significantly for arts, culture, and humanities, which is a very good thing uh, that people recognize that uh, despite uh, the problems of COVID that uh, uh, these uh, efforts are well worth the uh, investment. Now, individual giving, when it comes down to it, what we call the Pareto principle, 20% of the donors usually provide about 80% of the funds. Uh, you have to identify your highest yield donors and you have to go at them uh, in any way you could communicate with them uh, to identify them and to follow up with them. Now, uh, sorry for the slide confusion here. This uh, slide shows how the various uh, age groups uh, millennials, baby boomers, Gen Z, uh, how they uh, give. And it, it you can see that online uh, is over 50% of, uh, through, through credit cards, debit cards, uh, over 50% of the donations. Uh, cash is fairly small uh, and... Uh, but the importance of online, and, and if you look at the, the bottom set, you see that whether it's through social media, email, or website, uh, you, you have to have a program that reaches out to all that all, through all these means. Uh, now, for, from an individual donor standpoint, about 57% uh, are enrolled in a recurring giving program. That is incredibly important. You want that recurring giving, whether it's uh, monthly or whether it's uh, you spend money to continue that uh, donation. Uh, One-time gifts average about $121, uh, and also 9% uh, of the individuals participate in workplace giving programs where there are matching funds uh, from their uh, place of business. Now, is this a good time to ask for funds? Absolutely. Yes, there is inflation, but it's not historically affected charitable contributions. And as I said, even during COVID, contributions were uh, expanding. Of course, our economy is still expanding 
And many people have large cash reserves, uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably the older you, you have, uh, including retirees, uh, they, that's where a lot of the cash is sitting. And there it's available if you can give them a good reason to uh, donate. Uh, people, it feels good to give. And, uh, you know, uh, and you have to find those prospects, whether, you know, what their age is, what their income, their tax status, uh, are they on Social Security? Uh, even though inflation is a problem in the economy, it's not the same to all. And there's a lot of people who aren't, who are set in their residence, who are, have the income and the balance sheet to be able to give. You just have to find them and they do want to help. So you have to convince them of your purpose. But if you don't ask, people think you do not need the help. Now, a donations page on your website is critical. Uh, as we said, online donations are in, was over 50% of the general donations. It's increased about 23% a year and over half are repeat donors which is exactly what you want. Online monthly giving revenue has increased 40% and it's increasingly popular. And that, that is excellent. Monthly versus annually is easier because it's you know much less expensive, at least in the eyes of the donor. Now, you need a, a very good donation page. Perfect donation page, uh, is what you uh, have to uh, strive for so that you can raise more money than ever. Uh, and it needs to have features that will engage the donors. It, if you have a page that is too slow, it's too complicated, it, you know, it just doesn't work and you will not get anything out of it. Uh, the worst thing you could do is force a donor to create an account in order to make a donation. It's a terrible idea that would drastically increase your number of incomplete donations. Uh, so please don't force people to make an account. Keep it as concise as possible. Make sure your branding is consistent. Obviously you have to tell how the money will be used Optimize for mobile because probably more than half the people will use their phone as opposed to their computer. And then you must have a process where you immediately thank the donors. Make sure your page runs on multiple platforms. Check out Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, Firefox, etc. Make sure your website is secure if you're collecting data. Now, in individual giving, you must have budget proje projections up to date and available to show everyone. You have to constantly re-examine re your case for need. Make sure it's relevant in the light of COVID, uh, revised based on changes forced by COVID. Now you may say, well, COVID's over. Well, a lot of people changed their behavior, a lot of foundations changed their their uh, objectives due to COVID, and they haven't changed back. They still may be li uh, working remote. They still may be favoring food banks as opposed to cultural entities. Uh, SCORE had problems with a number of its, uh, of its uh, funders. Uh, during COVID, who said that they've changed their priorities away from new business, entrepreneurship, to social services such as food banks. Uh, even though COVID's over, they retain that bias, and you have to go and redo your your pitch, your 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 demonstrate your need, uh, and try to convince people that. Uh, uh, we're in a post-COVID uh, scenario. And therefore, you have to make donor recruitment and fundraising a high priority. And as I said earlier on, 
at least half time person has to work uh, at this. I spent probably five years, pretty much half time, uh, poor score, uh, just attending events, reaching out to uh, potential donors and trying to uh, update them on our progress. And that's very, very important. Once you get a donation, you have to continue to give updates on your progress so that people uh, know that their money is being uh, well utilized. So you have to come up with a statement of need. That's the bait. And you have to write it. You have to know it inside out and backward. You have to cast a vision uh, that is so compelling that it convinces them to make a gift. It, and it has to be written from the donor perspective. Tell the donors why you need funding and what outcomes you expect from their investment. It's why you need their money and why their investment uh, is important. That to, and why it should be done now. Uh, have to work on this. One thing, it's possible that, uh, uh, you know, you, once you do it, you would have to update it fairly often as you make progress and you change uh, the needs for the, your, your need for the money. Can I make a comment here? Sure. Um, I have a client who um, has a nonprofit that helps kids uh, get school supplies and so forth. Um, and one of the things she does that I think promotes donors to give more is she will say, if you give me $10, that will purchase you know, so many notebooks, et cetera. If you give me $25, that will allow me to buy a backpack and fill it with certain things. So, you know, if I'm looking at the website and I think, well, maybe I'll, I'll give $5. If I know $10 is going to purchase a package of stuff, I might be encouraged to give 10 instead of five. And then maybe... 25 instead of 20. So if you can give people a picture of what their donation is going to purchase, that goes a long way to encourage them. I'm done. Very good. Uh, so in your case statement, you have to evoke emotion. You have to paint a picture of why someone should invest in you. Why are you unique? Why is what is the history of your organization? Why did it it develop? Explanation of your programs. What difference are you making? How will the funds be used? What difference will your gift make? What can you do to help? Um, in, in part of this is you don't necessarily have to ask just for money. You might ask for volunteers. We at SCORE ask for volunteers all the time because uh, we're a, an all volunteer organization. So if you need uh, more than uh, financial support or you may need uh, you know help, hands, you have to put that request uh, in your case statement. Now, one of the ways uh, to get individual funding is through crowdfunding, which is uh, reaching out to a much broader uh, audience uh, through the, uh, the the internet. And you you set a goal, you tell your story, you involve supporters, you add pictures and videos, uh, and you're doing this on a platform. Uh, which uh, we'll list in the next slide, the various platforms. Uh, you must communicate through email, uh, text, share social media. And of course you have to thank donors and, and, and this process with withdrawal funds. This is a crowdfunding process, but you don't do this independently. You have to use a platform. Here's the top crowd, crowdfunding sites for nonprofits. Causebox, 
Funley causes rally, crowd rise, ignition deck. Many are free to use, but there's always going to be a fee for the donations. They have to get paid somehow. Uh, so they, they sort of control the process for you. Uh, but it really comes down to you, uh, much like individual uh, uh, seeking individual donations, you have to present the case. And it's just a way to get it out to a much, much broader or audience. Now, many uh, nonprofits overlook imp implementing what's called a, a legacy gifts program. Uh, you know, as uh, and I and one part here is everybody uh, who is in retirement has uh, uh, you know fin financial uh, means and have IRAs or uh, 401ks, et cetera, but particularly IRAs, once you retired, uh, you uh, have to um, uh, you have to uh, release that money and give it back and pay taxes on that if they were tax deferred and gained. Now after it's called R and B, uh, uh, and RMDs kick in now at age 73. When I was younger, uh, it kicked in at 70 and a half. And what we have to do is if you have a, a set of investments, each year you have to uh, uh, pay taxes on that. And what is overlooked is if you donate it to charity, you do not have to pay tax on that. That's a huge amount of money out there and, and there's uh, literally millions of people uh, contribute what's called RMDs uh, to avoid taxes on their distributions from their tax-free funds. And this is where you want to tap. Uh, it, it, it's an incredible uh, opportunity to get uh, donations. Uh, and at the same time, the donor saves does it, saves on paying taxes on it, his investments. Uh, so if you need to know more about that, your, your financial advisor, or I'm sure most of the SCORE advisors uh, can help you with that. But uh, there's a lot of money uh, available um, to be tapped, but you have to get to know how to tap it. And it's not the easiest thing in the world. You have to uh, uh, find the people uh, who have this these uh, uh, RMD obligations. Now, once you get donors, you have to you have to obviously track them, keep uh, track of them uh, through uh, CRM softwares. The uh, here's four of them: Boomerang, Donor Perfect, Network for Good, Salesforce. Uh, and it depends on how many donors you have. Scora has a handful. We don't need software. We can use a simple uh, spreadsheet. Uh, but if you're going to get small number of donations from a large number of people, you need a network uh, uh, system to track your donors. Now, the main sources of, of uh, grants uh, are corporate, uh, they're the federal government, uh, they're state and municipal funded grant resources, and uh, they're all different. Let's start uh, with the corporate. Uh, first of all, corporate giving programs can be one of two types, uh, like almost all banks have foundations, but they also have community development uh, departments and funds. Uh, if it's a larger amount, they're gonna generally put you through the foundation. If it's for community development or if it's a non-recurring kind of grant, 
uh, request, uh, you'll use the their community development money. Uh, it's usually a lot easier to get the community development money than it is the foundation money because of the process uh, and the approval process. Now, one of the things uh, in corporate giving is that many uh, corporations have matching gift programs. And, and you should always ask a donor if employee, if, if, if their company matches. Um, and uh, the, for example, uh, at uh, SCORE through the years, we've gotten matches from IBM, from uh, uh, ConocoPhillips, and uh, other large companies. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how much is out there for, from a matching standpoint. It says 65% of Fortune 500 companies have matching gifts. And four to 10 billion goes unclaimed every year. And there's about 18 million people work for companies that have matching gift uh, programs. Obviously, you want to try to find those people. And two to three billion dollars a year are donated through that capability. And uh, it's it's really a good thing if you could find that. Here's some a list of some of the companies such as General Electric, British Petroleum, Exxon. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, they all have matching GIF. And you can see uh, a significant amount of money, uh, you know, uh, for example, at, uh, through Microsoft, you get up to $15,000 matched. Now, uh, there are a lot of private foundations out there. Many private foundations uh, exist solely to better society by supporting other nonprofits. Uh, they make grants rather than directly running a charitable activity themselves. A couple of examples would be Cleveland Foundation, Community Foundation of Lorain County, for example. Uh, they uh, gather donations from other people and other companies and they manage the process of giving it to other nonprofits. And so they don't run charitable nonprofits themselves. They support charitable nonprofits. These funds are uh, such as Cleveland Foundation are extremely important. And if you, you uh, it's very easy to go identify them, go online and understand their missions. And if you can uh, match their mission, then it's pretty easy to follow their process to get funding. I'm not saying it's easy to get funds. I'm saying it's easy to to apply for it. They are very difficult to get. It takes, and it takes a lot of time through private foundations. Oops. If you're going to uh, apply to private foundations, you need a cover letter, a business plan, that's your case statement, a description of your mission and your need your, uh, for your nonprofit, what you will address, project budgets and financial needs. Uh, and, and most of these are online. Here's a comment that many of those private foundations uh, really change their objectives during COVID and may not have changed. And, and what this means is if you're a startup nonprofit, uh, it's very difficult to get money from private foundations. Uh, you need to, it, it's very rare that they'll do a, a startup. Here again, our list of uh, top private corporation foundations. You see Walmart, uh, SCORE has gotten money from Walmart in the past. And it's interesting. You can get it from individual stores. Uh, actually, the, their, their managers have a budget for uh, donations, or you get it through their, their corporate headquarters. Wells Fargo is a large one. SCORE is fortunate that we do get money from Wells Fargo and uh, have in the past. And you can see, again, there's financials, there's the oil companies, Microsoft, 
uh, these big companies uh, have wonderful foundations, but you could, as you can imagine, there's an awful lot of people applied to them, and it's always good to have a connection. Uh, we have a connection, at, for example, at Wells Fargo, um, and we ha had, when I was in Philadelphia, had a connection with Walmart, uh, and uh, we have a connection. It's not on this list, but IBM has uh, a big foundation, and we have a connection with them, too. Uh, one of the ways you, you find out who has grants, you search grants within www.grants.gov. It's a great source, uh, and it takes a little bit of work, but uh, you can find a uh, uh, list of foundations. Uh, top ones that you'll find are National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for Humanities. Uh, there's a lot of state and state and city uh, government grants, and you'll find them on their websites. For example, the city of Cleveland is running a, a storefront renewal program uh, that uh, if you're putting a retail one upgrade a retail business in the city of Cleveland, they have money. Uh, in the past, for example, Lakewood has money, had money for uh, a storefront renewal and advertising. Uh, you have these change all the time, but you have to uh, look at where you live and where you uh, want to seek uh, where your your place of business is. You have to check out the local city, uh, even county and the state and whether there's a uh, grant program. They come and go and you have to continue to look. I would say maybe each quarter you check out these websites. There are state national endowment for humanity councils that have funding. Uh, and then perhaps most important here is we have a partner called Candid and it, you, its website is candid.org. They have a database of all the foundations. And they also, we have, uh, uh, there's a, is a, it's a national organization, but they have the Cleveland office and we have a close uh, relationship with one of their members uh, or one of their managers, David Holmes. And uh, we, a lot of clients, our nonprofit clients, we use Candid to uh, uh, find out which foundations are relevant to your nonprofit. David will be um, demonstrating how to use their database uh, before our grant presentation uh, later this month. Yeah, I have the date and time for that in the last slide. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, here's a list of uh, of uh, websites that uh, again uh, you'll be getting this link. Or, or these uh, these slides in this recording, so you can follow up with that. Uh, these sources, uh, but Candid is uh, for private foundations. Uh, you have to go to Ohio.gov to find out what what's going on with the state. You have to go to the city, and as I said before, should do this maybe every quarter, every six months, because uh, uh, those programs come and go. Now, if you're a, a woman in business, uh, uh, nonprofit, there are Federal Department of Health grants, National Foundation, Science Foundation grants, uh, We Magazine has grants, Cabbage Women's Womenpreneurs blog has grants. Uh, Anita, you uh, have more experience than I in this area. You, you want to comment? Yeah, um, these are ones that we've checked recently. Um, you can also Google. You'll find there are companies. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these small grants are restricted to employees or related to employees of certain companies. So you can go to those sites and look through the grants that are available. And if you find one, um, they generally, again, have online applications. And the ones that you find here 
might be more amenable to startups. Um, some of them have are very specific for startups for women, but they're generally small amounts in the in the neighborhood of one to five thousand dollars. So not uh, certainly worth looking into. Okay, thank you. And a few more tips. Uh, and this is always a good one, whether it's for a nonprofit or a for-profit business. Find an established business similar to your own. Reach out, introduce yourself, ask about its early days. Look into your professional peers and in the nonprofit space is a great strategy for focusing on what has already worked. Uh, it, it's even better if you could find these a little bit of a geographic distance away so they don't think you're competing for the same dollars. You know, maybe there's somebody in Columbus or Toledo uh, or Pittsburgh that have a similar nonprofit, but people like to talk about what their success and how, uh, how they've gotten funded. Now I, for example, uh, the Cleveland chapter and, and when I was in the Philadelphia chapter, I would look at how SCORE raised money throughout the country. What were they doing in California, Florida, uh, Chicago, et cetera? Uh, <clears throat> reach out to the people, check out their websites. Often other nonprofits will list their sponsors on their websites and it'll give you an idea uh, on you know, what type of uh, uh, company has funded similar efforts. Uh, and uh, you'll find out this, particularly for banks. Banks uh, fund very similar things throughout the country. And uh, you've got to go identify, but all banks have, most banks have different missions. Some banks and some uh, private company foundations will, will focus on uh, uh, poverty. Some will do it on children. Some will do it uh, you know, for other purposes, you have to do the work uh, and find which one is similar to uh, matches your mission. But you don't have to uh, invent the wheel here. There are similar organizations somewhere in the country and they're getting funded. Find them, see how they're getting funded, see who the, the uh, give you an idea of who to reach out to them. And with the internet, it's really easy to try to uh, get this information. Now, the other thing is if you're a startup nonprofit and you've just uh, applied for your 501c3 status, uh, as you know, donors cannot get tax uh, deductions unless you have a 501c3. That's why you get one. So your donors can get tax uh relief. But you don't have to wait until the government actually grant you that. You could say that it's pending in essence. And um, you could start the process of getting your funding uh, saying that you've applied uh, for the 501c3. Now, grant writing skills, uh, we will have a Separate class on that uh, webinar coming up. In fact, Anita and David Holmes will be presenting it. Uh, and uh, But it's incredibly important to most nonprofits. Unless you're a national level institution, and I assume it isn't, uh, it's going to be depending on you how you're going to write your grants request. Uh, you can't, Candid does have writing classes uh, to help you start. Uh, my own experience was, you know, uh, to write grants for requests to foundations on behalf of SCORE required a, an intimate detail of the knowledge of SCORE, of your nonprofit. It, and hiring a, a, a grant writer, everybody said, well, what? Can I hire a grant writer? Well, you can, but you're going to have to teach them about your organization. And um, the online forms that you have to fill in are so detailed on what your purpose, 
what your financial details are, all your history, et cetera, that you're going to find out that it's probably best to do it yourself. Now, on the other hand, uh, if you have, once you do train a grant writer who would know your, your capability, then that, you know, that would work out in the future. But the beginning for a startup, it's very difficult to get a grant writer to understand what you know in your head or you, what you have is a business plan. So that's my personal opinion. Now, as I said, uh, the grant writing basics, I'll go th through this in reverse, the, with Anita and David Holmes is very important. Uh, it, it, it'll be on July 3rd at noon. And, uh, but we'll have one uh, on building capacity for your nonprofit. And that's you, Anita, isn't it? Uh, how to expand your nonprofit. That'll yeah, be no, I think Dan. I think oh, Dan, Dan Yerman will yeah. give it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that'll be on uh, June 26th at noon also. And mm -hmm. it's not here, but we also, we, I just got an uh, email this morning. Our Columbus chapter is doing one this Friday, uh, Columbus Score, on board of directors and governance. It's two mm -hmm. hours from 10 to 12 on this Friday, the 21st. Um, and uh, I'm sure if you just... Uh, search uh, Columbus score webinars you can you can register for that so there's three coming up in the next you know less than two weeks uh, that should uh, really help you out uh, building your capacity uh, grant writing basics and this uh, board of director uh, governance issues so uh, that's uh, what we have going on at score for nonprofits uh, this quarter and if you have any questions, uh, Anita and I'd be happy to address them. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment. Uh, any yeah. organization that has a database of nonprofits to identify other nonprofits to volunteer to get experience in the area, I want to get into homeless veterans. Um, well, if you go to the Candid website, they also have a, a list of organizations that have received grants as well as organizations that give grants uh, because Candid um, used to be the foundation center that had the database of all the grants and grant maker had the database with all the people who received grants. So now they've merged. So Candid has all of that information. But if you're interested in homeless veterans, you might want to go to the VA website. Uh, they have a voucher program for some veterans, but in most cases, if you, um, for instance, are looking for housing homeless veterans, you would expect that most of them would be self-pay or perhaps qualify for Section 8. So I would suggest, if you're interested in that, that you get a SCORE mentor uh, who helps with nonprofits, and they would be able to give you information on that. And I don't see that we have any other questions. So uh, again, I re will repeat that you will get a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. And uh, so we hope that you have found this inf information really helpful. Um, and uh, also hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. And Bob, thank you so much for doing the presentation.